Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Several weeks ago, Sarah and I began this series by talking about how when we enter into situations in life, kind of the metaphorical room of life, whether it's our workplace or church, uh, uh, maybe a a party, uh, maybe it's even the internet, wherever it might be, and we encounter someone across the room that we don't know, it's easy to judge them uh, based on maybe what they look, gender, background, age, ethnicity, and assume what they believe about some of these challenging issues in our culture. It can also be easy to assume what their life experiences have been, and, uh, but we don't really know. We all have different life experiences, don't we? We all grew up in different homes of origins. We grew up in different cities. We, dif- we grew up with different education experiences. We have different experiences um, in terms of what has been done to us or what we have done in the world. Um, not right, wrong, good or bad, just experiences, right? And it's through those experiences that we view these challenging topics that we have been dealing with on a weekly basis. And so today we come to the last topic, which is the topic of addiction. And when we're talking about addiction, uh, it, although it's easy to think about uh, maybe drugs or alcohol as primary, but I want us to expand our minds to think about addiction in lots of different ways. And our, our conversation our expert today with us will help us expand our minds beyond just that. But right, it has to do with um, eating, sexuality, shopping, gambling, uh, drugs, alcohol. There, there's lots of things that we can be addicted to. Uh, and so uh, the three things that we've been talking about that we want to have happen over the course of each week is one that our minds would be expanded, that we would see these topics and see the people who are touched by these topics in a different way. Right? That our minds would be expanded. We wouldn't just keep thinking about them in the same way that we've always thought about them. And the secondly, that our hearts would be expanded. That we would have empathy for those who are touched by these topics. And then third, uh, that we would be motivated by the love of Jesus to take action in some way. So that somehow we would feel called to go, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about this situation differently and I'm going to act on it differently. So uh, today we have the honor of having Chris Logan. Uh, And Chris, would you mind coming up? And you guys can give Chris a hand as he comes. There you go. Now, one of the reasons uh, beyond the fact that Chris is an expert on this topic, uh, he is a program supervisor at an organization called Simple Recovery, uh, which is right across the parking lot. They office in the 1901 building here on the corner, and we rent the schoolhouse from them each Sunday to do our children's ministry. So it's just a great, a great way for us to continue to, to try to work together in some way. So Chris, thank you yeah. for being here. Yeah. Hold that mic up there. Hold there you go. Here. Um, so first of all, let's talk about this topic. Why, why has, or how has this topic touched your life and why are you passionate about it? I, I, hi, you can talk I, to me yeah, or you can talk right, to them. This is really weird. Just, just talk to me. You, yeah, it's all good. No, but like just talking to you and yeah. trying to pretend like the rest of these people, they're are listening good. in yeah. to our conversation. You're good. Absolutely. So first off, I would love to uh, thank everyone for being here today and for being invited to speak on this topic. So I think the question, you know, that you ask is how has, or why has this topic touched me? And I think I'd like to start off the conversation by saying, who is an addict, right? And if I ask that question to you, what does an addict look like? Who is an addict? I think as you already touched on, we already have this preconceived notion of what or who an addict is. As though we can look out into a crowd and say, oh, that guy for sure is an addict, right? Addiction takes many forms, as you you mentioned. And Though I'm here to talk about chemical dependency, right, drug addiction, I would ask everybody to kind of look at 
how addiction has touched their lives, right? And really challenge themselves to, to think about, do they have any addictions of their own? Because I would be willing to bet that many of us do. Whether it be drugs, alcohol, sex, shopping, or that nice little device that's probably in your hey hand now, right hey now. Hey now, hey <laughs> now. Or in your pocket, right? Which all can take on forms of addiction. So we're going to talk a little bit about chemical dependency, and I'll get to why it's so important to me. Chemical dependency, when we, when we hear the numbers, 65 to 70,000 people died last year of drug overdoses, overdoses in the United yeah. States. Just this past Friday was National Overdose Awareness Correct. Day. So when you're talking about numbers that big, you're talking about you know, over 100 people a day, that's not a me problem, that's a we problem, right? The idea that that many people are dying and nobody's talking about what's going on. So I think we need to start by understanding that this is much bigger than, than what we realize. Take me to your personal story, though. How, how did this begin to impact you as an adolescent? So just quickly before we get to that, and, I, and I'll dive right into yeah, that. Yeah. I think to give people an understanding of how addiction works. Clinically, addiction's defined as a genetic predisposition that... It's a genetic predisposition, meaning I have a gene, right, that's turned on by an environmental factor that's driven by stress and craving. Dr. Bob Silkworth of Alcoholics Anonymous defines addiction or alcoholism This is tough. As, you know, I've done this a million times. And for whatever reason, I'm stuck, right? So we're talking about, we're talking about the phenomenon of craving, right? Yeah. We're talking about a genetic predisposition. And it's okay? been turned on by the environment it's been turned somehow. turned on by the environment, yeah. right? So what we're going to say is I have a father and a mother, right, both who... Uh, my mom struggled with addiction. My dad is an alcoholic, okay? So I'm given the gene for alcoholism and or addiction unknowingly, right? You didn't ask for it. Didn't ask for it, right? Got the same one for the blue eyes, and I'm glad I got that one. <laughs> but I didn't ask for the one that, that would later be turned on by my environment, right? Yeah. Somewhere around age 15. Just, just prior before that. Alcoholics have what's called a, a spiritual malady. Which means that we're, we have this hole that we feel never can be filled. We have a voice that tells us that we're never good enough. It's an inferiority complex. The imposter syndrome. They're going to find out who I really am. Sure. I'm never good enough. I'm never fast enough. I'm never good looking enough. I'm never strong enough, whatever it is. So we begin to search for things to fill that hole. Mm -hmm. So at age 15, I begin to experiment with alcohol. Again, already having this feeling that I'm not good enough. I don't fit in. I've always been different. A couple of friends of mine and myself get a hold of some two 40-ounce bottles of Old English 800. If you've ever drank that stuff, don't. And that, that day, a feeling would come over me that I'd never felt before. Hmm. And not understanding what that feeling was at that time, I'd suddenly felt that I belonged. Mm. I felt good enough. It would be from that day on, for the majority of the next 15 years, the genetic thing was turned on within me. The craving would 
began to take over and I would battle addiction for the next 15 years of my life. And that, that battle took you it, it beyond alcohol Way into beyond alcohol. In, to drugs um, and uh, kind of at your lowest point, at what point did you um, somehow begin to make a turn? What, what was that? What was your bottom? What was your lowest point? So when we look at my story, it began somewhere around age 15. And what we know is alcoholism and addiction is progressive. So these things would begin to pile up over the, the next 15 years of my life. Mm-hmm. You know, you would like to be able to think that at some point somebody would turn around and go, can you not see all of these consequences that are happening? And you would stop. But understanding that my brain and my body are working against me. Mm-hmm. That I have a body that craves alcohol and drugs once it enters my body. I have an obsession of the mind, right? That tells me that I can drink or use like anybody else. It'll be different this time, that somehow um, I'll be able to control it, you know? And understanding that my genetics, the way that I'm made up, is that I have what's called a genetic low response to alcohol. So at age 15, when I, when I started to drink, my friends would drink about half of the bottle and they would start to feel the effects. And for me to feel like them, I would have to drink two times more. Mm. So I'm not trying to out drink anybody. I'm just trying to get to where you're at. Mm-hmm. Fast forward, that is the pattern of my drinking and drug use for the next 15 years. My drinking and drug use would take me in and out of jail for a number of times. At at age 18, I would be arrested for the first time for going the wrong way on a one-way bridge. At age 18 or 19, um, actually, I think I was a little bit older, I would be arrested for a high-speed chase and driving my car through a house, right? And you would think that six months in jail, a stint in rehab, and all of these things would be enough to to make me stop, mm-hmm. but those weren't my bottoms. Yeah. Because did, we, did we see you on TV? Just a light moment here. Just to, you know, did we ever see you on TV? No, you didn't. Okay. All right. Allegedly. I know you were thinking that. Yeah. I know you were thinking it. Right. Okay. And so I would continue to build up these consequences throughout my life, but continuing to understand that it's the spiritual malady that drives me to continue doing what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. The idea that I'm not good enough, because pretty soon the drugs and the alcohol, they stop working. Somewhere around 2002, I picked up a habit of methamphetamine, where my life began to really come to some, some deep and, and some dark places. Are you holding it down a job? Are you living with family? Are you living on the streets? So are you- there's, a, there's periods of my addiction where I look like I'm doing okay, right? Where I may have a job here and there or I'm able to hold a job. But again, internally, I'm dying. Mm. Internally, I, can't, I want to stop. There are periods where I'm able to stop for a short amount of time, and that's enough to convince myself that, hey, you know what, you can have one. Yeah. But I can't have one, because when I have one, this thing is turned on inside of me that I can't turn off. Mm-hmm. You see? And so as I begin, you know, holding down jobs here and there, right, somewhere around 2002, uh, I, I was working at Home Depot, and uh, I was living with my aunt and my uncle, and my amphetamine addiction had gotten really out of control, and they decided that they were going to move, and so they, you know, they let me know that, hey, you know, we love you, but we can't watch you go down this path. We're wow. moving. Best of luck to you. Mm. It, it's there that things would begin to, to, go, to spiral very out of, out of control very deeply. And I would quit that job, and from that point on, I wouldn't work for a number of years. So my addiction would carry me, you know. And I'd be arrested several times in between here and there. And it, this continuing thing inside of you that, that, that drives you, it's hopeless. Addiction is a disease of hopelessness. See, I've gone so far down that I don't think that there's any hope. Mm-hmm. I've lived a life of self-destruction, wanting to die every day, but not having the guts to kill myself. Mm-hmm. So you reach a point of thinking that there's no way out. So I would continue to do these things, and this thing would drive to tell me that, you know, I have an allergic 
reaction to drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. But my brain tells me differently. February 18th, 2006, I was arrested one more time, charged with felony drug possession and attempt attempt to to sell drugs and, and all of this stuff. And I was looking at prison time And I don't know if you guys saw me walk up here, but I'm not a guy that belongs in prison. (laughs) But at this point, I'm filled with hopelessness. I'm filled with despair. I'm filled with that there's no way out of this. Mm -hmm. And that drugs and alcohol have taken me to a position in my life where I don't want to live. I can't see any hope. February 18, 2006, in an Orange County jail cell, debating on whether or not to continue my life of drug addiction and hopelessness and despair I laid in the floor of that jail cell and I reached out to God I would go in front of the judge and from that day forward um, don't, don't skip over that moment you lay on the floor cell and, and you cry out to God why did you cry out to God what did you say what was going through your mind and heart I'd held on to my life for so long. Just white knuckling every single day. See, I don't want to drink and I don't want to use. I've told everybody around me countless times that I'm not going to do it anymore, but I continue to do it. You see, that's not the issue. The issue is that I've woken up and I've told myself I'm not going to do this anymore. But I continue to do it. Because again, I have this thing that drives me to telling me that it'll be different this time. And I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to live my life this way. But I'm completely powerless and out of control. Mm -hmm. So not knowing what I'm doing, other than not wanting to die, I reach out and I start to pray. And I ask God, God, please don't let me go to prison. Please don't let me go to prison. Yeah, yeah. So you go before the judge. Yes. And let's fast forward through this a little bit. What, sure. what, what, what happened? What, what was your next step? So the judge tells me, Mr. Logan, you're, you're, today we're going to grant you a, a drug diversion uh, a drug diversion course. Uh, it's called Prop 36. And he says, the best of luck to you because if you do come in front of me again, you will be going straight to prison. And so I leave there that day not knowing what is going to be of the rest of my life, right? Just knowing that I don't want to go to prison. And you had to go into a, a treatment plan, a treatment so center? this is an outpatient treatment facility. So they basically just set me out on the street and I returned to a drug house where I was living and selling drugs because I had nowhere else to go. And uh, there just happened to be a person there who said, have you ever gone to sober living? And I was like, I don't even know what sober living is. And she was like, call this number. So I called the number and a guy said, "Uh, yeah, no, I don't know if we can help you or not. And he hung up on me. And I just remember I picked the phone up and I called him back. I'm like, dude, you don't get this, right? Like I got nowhere else to go. I can't go to prison and I don't want to die. And he's like, all right, come by and let's see what we can do. And I would go to that sober living house and I would live there for the next three and a half years. At some point I would become the manager and and all of these things. I would walk to this drug diversion class every day and I would complete the class and, um, you know, I I would get into a program of Alcoholics and and, and Narcotics Anonymous and I would start to work the steps and develop this conscious contact with a higher power who I choose to call God, right? And we would, days would just go by and there's always still this, this hopelessness that's there, but you start to see some hope and you start to see some light. And you start to think about, you know, what, what the future might look like day by day. Mm-hmm. And now you have 12 years of sobriety. God willing, if I do everything I'm supposed to, I will lay my head down sober tonight and I'll have a little bit over 12 years of sobriety. Yes, sir. You, yeah. I mean, that's huge. Uh, you're now uh, working every day helping people get right. sober and gain freedom. Yeah, I try. <laughs> so um, 
I see, uh, yes, uh, let's see, it was last Sunday. My wife and I stopped by a uh, uh, El Pollo Loco on Harbor Boulevard, right next to Wiener Schnitzel. You know where that oh, is? Oh, yeah, I eat yeah. there all the time. Yeah, El Pollo Loco. Yeah. Uh, which one? The one right here. El Pollo Loco or Wiener Schnitzel? No, El Pollo Loco. Okay. <sighs> She's, I like both. Don't do that. Uh, there were two people standing on the corner, uh, a guy and a, a gal. I, I don't know their ages, 20s, 30s. And they've got their stuff in their arms, and he is like this, right? And she's next to him, holding on. And she's, right? And there's a part of me, because I'm a, doc, I'm, I'm a photographer, I'm a filmmaker, I like social media, I'm like, oh man, I gotta get a picture of that. Anybody else ever felt that way? Yeah. Oh man, I gotta get a picture of that. And I was like, yeah, no. I'm not gonna get a picture of that. Because that's brokenness. That's uh, pain. Um, so I can, I can look at those two individuals through one set of eyes and judge them and say, oh, these people are trashing our city. Um, look at these losers. Uh, why don't they get a job? Just stop taking drugs. Um, uh, they're, 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 they're causing problems in our streets, right? And I can feel that way. Sure. I can personally, right now, can feel that way. I can also feel a deep <clears throat> sadness and a deep compassion for them. And not knowing and imagining their history. No clue. I have no clue of what their history is. None. And how they have not had things that I have had or vice versa. And it really doesn't matter the comparison. Bottom line is their story is unique. Yeah. This is where they're at in this moment. Um, help, uh, you know, take us uh, as someone who has been in that moment. Mm -hmm. You've probably stood on the curb. Oh, yeah. uh, you've also been the guy in the car looking at the person on the curb. Yeah. Take us through what, what would be... Um, the way that you would want us to view those individuals, what would you call us to in terms of viewing them in that moment? I'm not going to get out and try to help them. They're obviously in a place where they, they could not receive help. Uh, they were super high. So, but, but how, how would you invite us to see them? What lens or eyes would you like us to look through? So it's, it, there's a couple of things, right? That I, I would, I would, say to anybody that yeah you know the reality is is that they are having an impact on our society they are having impact on our community they do you know I would never excuse the behavior of addicts right having been one myself and done some pretty terrible things I would never excuse those things but understand that those are symptoms of a disease right and I think if the, the more that we can seek to understand rather than to be understood, is to look at those people and, and, and gain a different perspective and understand that they're suffering from a disease, right? And the idea is many people will say, well, it's not a disease, it's a choice. When your body begins to crave drugs, make no mistake about it, that's pure suffering. Pure suffering. Pure suffering. As everyone sits in here, right, when we talk about a craving, we're talking about something that cannot be satisfied. You're talking about something that happens under a level of subconscious. You see, each of you are satisfying a craving right now as you take a breath in. If someone were to take that air away, your body would begin to crave air like it's never craved anything else mm -hmm. to a point of pure panic and survival. It's not a choice. It's not a choice. The choice starts long before that, yes. Mm -hmm. Addiction is a disease of choice. There were choices. There were at, at one point. Yes. Right? But maybe they didn't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe they had no idea of their genetic makeup. 
Many of the times, they, you know, as young people, they experiment with things and not understanding what is about to be set into motion. So it does reach a point where there is no longer a choice. Mm-hmm. It is about survival. So if we can look at those people as people that are suffering from a disease, right? Mm-hmm. And they are in the midst of their disease. And all of these other things, homelessness, right? The, the, the crime and, and, and all of those things are symptoms of this disease. Mm-hmm. And I think there's another thing that we need to understand is that when you look at that person, it's the drugs that are telling them they want to continue. Because if you were able to sit with that person for a minute, they would probably tell you, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live like this. You hear people say that every day. All the time? Yeah, every day. So um, take take me to a place of hope. Right? We've talked about the hopelessness. Take mm-hmm. me to a place of hope. Yeah. Tell me what you are doing sure. through Simple Recovery mm-hmm. and how you help people. This is not an advertisement. It's just one example yeah. of what you yeah. do. So take me through the process just briefly of how you take someone from that place on the curb through a process of help and hope. Sure. Well, it starts with that willingness to want to do something different, right? And which many of them come in with, with some, not it's not a whole lot sometimes, but all, you know, that's all we need is just a glimpse, right? A glimpse of willingness and a glimpse of hope to do something different. You know, from start to finish, it's, you know, it's, it's that individual. Sometimes this, this takes months, okay? A person might call and say, hey, you know what, man? I'm, I'm really struggling here. I want to get some treatment. And we say, okay, let's get this thing set. Well, I got this one thing I got to do, you know? And so they'll go over a period of time sometimes and we'll, get, we'll finally get them in. And we'll begin an assessment process. But it all starts by being able to look at that person and understand that they're suffering. That's how you're seeing them. That's how I see them. That's yes. how my staff sees them. That's how we all understand that these people are suffering. Yeah. And they are in the midst of a progressive and fatal disease. Mm-hmm. Their life is on the line. Right. So they go through detox. Sure. At your, you guys have in-house de- have detox. Mm-hmm. In-house detox, uh, and then they uh, live in a sober living home. And as they're going through a sober living process, what would you say the key is between someone who is successful in continuing with their sobriety and someone who is more prone to relapse? What's that? What is that? What is that? I know it's not one thing. It's very complex. Sure. But what is that yeah. thing that you would point to that you see more often than not is the thing that helps them gain freedom? It, when people come in with the willingness, right? And so you'll often hear, well, an addict has to hit their bottom. And it's like, well, who, who gets to decide what that bottom is, right? Your bottom may be different than mine. The addict. So they have to decide at some point that they want to do something differently. It's those who come in and are willing to take direction. Those who come in who are open to the process and trusting of the people that are around them. The hard part about that is I'd I'd love to say that every treatment center that's out here is an ethical treatment center and that they're doing things right, but that's not the truth. That that, That every sober living is doing the things the right way, but that's not the truth. So they have to be able to, we have to build that rapport with them. And it all starts from a place of love. It all starts from a place of love and hope. For me to be able to sit across from somebody or my, one of my staff members to be able to sit across from somebody and say, dude, we get it. Mm -hmm. And all of these things don't make up who you are. These are all symptoms. And as we get you in here, we can start to, right? So it's that therapeutic bond that we build. Just say that again, because this is super clear for any of us who struggle with uh, uh, addictions, behaviors that are challenges on an ongoing basis. You said all of these things don't add up to. All of these things don't make you who you are. All of these things don't make you who you are. No. Those are symptoms of your disease, right? And, 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 and the idea that if I look at you based on your symptoms, I would just think that you're a bad person. Mm-hmm. But that's not the case. See, because we don't, I don't know where you came from. See, people can say things along the lines of, well, addicts are people who didn't have A, B, and C growing up. They didn't have parents. They didn't have money. They were, that's not a true statement. Some have. I deal with a lot of kids that, today who come from 
families that, you know, their parents have been married for 10 years and they, they, they're well off and they live here in Newport Beach and they've had every opportunity. But once they started drinking and using, we start to look at, oh, you, you've got addiction in your family, mm-hmm. right? So there's no way to tell. So um, how, many, how many homes do you guys operate? What, tell us about kind of the breadth of your, just real sure. quick. Simple Recovery is a uh, six-bed residential detox, so we can do detox res. Uh, we also have two sober living homes within the area, and we have a, an a intensive uh, outpatient and partial hospitalization program that we do right over here and also out of the schoolhouse um, right here. In, in, uh, so you, you can get detox, you can get residential treatment, you can get outpatient treatment, and we can help you get into a sober living. Every, uh, every uh, twice a month? Every, yeah, every, so every other Thursday, I host a families and aftercare or community support group for families of, uh, you know, people, in a, people who have addictions. Uh, some of them are former uh, parents of clients, but it's open to anybody who would like to come and get the education. So catch this, every other Thursday, right at the schoolhouse. Yep. Or oh, no, it's right, in, in, 1901, in 1901, Suite 210. Okay, so Suite 210, 1901, any... Any person in the community that has a friend or family member who is uh, being impacted by addiction can come to the community support meeting just to talk about it, understand what other people are going through so that you're not alone and uh, and even find next steps. Um, I know that if you or someone else is dealing with a chemical dependency, Chris Mm -hmm. is open to talking to you today. Absolutely. Uh, You can go to Simple Recovery. If you pull out this piece of paper real quick, if you wouldn't mind, it's in your bulletin. It says conversation on addiction. Um, The last URL, simplerecovery.com. I know one of the things about Chris is if Simple Recovery is not a good fit for whatever reason in terms of you or someone that you know, uh, they will re- refer you to other resources. So just know that he is available for that. I also wanted to draw your attention as we kind of conclude our conversation to um, a number of 12-step groups here that are just open to the, to the public, right? You go to this website, uh, whether it's alcoholics, narcotics, sexaholics, gamblers, debtors, meaning uh, overspending, Um, Any of those, you go to the website, click find a meeting. You can find a meeting in Orange County. There's, uh, I think, a meeting in every one of those deals locations. If you're going, hey, I just need to get some help with some people. I want it to be anonymous. That's a great next step. Just know that that's available to you. Um, Also, Al-Anon and Alateen are for uh, families and friends. Uh, Alateen is obviously for teenagers who have parents who are um, struggling with addiction. And that's another resource. Or brothers or sisters. Brothers or, or, or sisters. Things. So what, when you look to the Al-Anon directory online, and you're going to want to look for meetings. If, if you're a parent of, they have parent of meetings, and then they have just open Al-Anon meetings. So you want to be able to make sure you get to the right one. Yeah. The other thing too is um, if you go to one and you don't like it, just just try another one, right? It's, it's one of those things where... Um, not every meeting will fit every individual, but there's enough of them around here that you should be able to find one that you like. If not, like I said, the, the community meeting that I host every other Thursday is not an Al-Anon meeting, but it's a, it's a community support group. That's great. I also listed a counseling, a Center Journeys Counseling right here in Costa Mesa. They do licensed marriage family therapy. So any of these issues that you might want to address, um, they uh, would love to be able to, to see you as well. They work on a sliding scale in terms of the, 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 pay, the financial payment. So um, Chris, thank you for sharing your story. And mm-hmm. thanks for showing us um, a way to look at individuals and situations through different eyes and um, thanks for inviting us yeah. to uh, get some help for those of us who need some help. So would you, I didn't ask you beforehand, would you feel comfortable praying for us? Or would you rather me to pray? Is, it, is that okay? You want me to do it? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, dude. Yeah. All right. All right, good. <laughs> so the band wouldn't mind coming up for our last song. Chris, if you would pray for us. Lord, I just want to thank you for providing us with this time today, that you've brought us all here in, in hopes to touch our hearts and to, to change our minds. You know that we, our minds can be strong, Lord, when you're not in our hearts. And, and the idea that we can live in a community where so many people suffer, where so many people are hurt day in and day out at the hands of addiction, 
Lord, that you would, that you would change our hearts, that you would help us to see that they are suffering, that they are hurting, and that they do need and deserve help, that you would work on each of us as individuals and understand that we too suffer at some point of our own addictions. And Lord, we just pray that you continue to bring us together as a community, that you continue to show us the way. And, and, and again, Lord, that you help us to seek to understand rather than to be understood. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.